So uh, I'm Mike, I'd like to show this slide just because for those of you, is just a quick show of hands, how many people are actually trying to run their own business or thinking of starting something up or that, that's what they've got? Excellent, so if you've been at this for 25, pushing 30 years that I've been, um, I've been doing startups and in the, uh, actually in the technology business, you should look this tired by the time you get a picture of you taken. So, uh, but uh, tweet out at me. And so let me tell you a little bit about Agreement Express first. Uh, so first off, Agreement Express, as was mentioned, we're in the onboarding automation software. Think of it as a specialty world of business process management. Um, it's, uh, Kurt's not here now, but it's a slightly more exciting world than accounting software. Um, but not by a, by a heck of a lot until you start getting into the fun stuff that we do with respect to risk and other aspects like that. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't say for Phil, who's staring me down, uh, we currently we have 17 open positions in our organization between Vancouver and Toronto right now. So if you're in engineering, you're in sales, you're in product management, you're in any of those other roles, please reach out to our people, to Phil who's waving his hand dramatically, uh, to any of those folks that, uh, that work with me because I'm a fan of Lauren and her message already because uh, we've done that profitably and we've, been, uh, we've, we've, we've enjoyed a, approximately about a 43% compound annual growth rate for the last five years. And we've done that with our own capital, not with venture capital, no offense to the VCs in the room. So, all right, so who are our customers? So the, the customers that we have, and by the way, this is really hard to do when you start up a financial technology company. So if you're thinking of getting into this space and you're hoping that you can have these types of customers, Visa, National Bank, Hollis Wealth, Global Payments, Vantive. In fact, uh, I think more than 40% of my customers are in the Fortune 500. It's really hard to break into that market. So you have to have patience and perseverance and so today, what we're going to talk about is in Vancouver, I did a presentation called the FinTech Lessons from, from uh, or I did the uh, one called Entrepreneurial Lessons from the Martian. Today, we're doing FinTech Lessons from the Martian. For those that wonder why I use this as a, as a metaphor for what we do in the technology industry, if you haven't seen the movie and you're an entrepreneur, watch the movie, think about what you're seeing, and ultimately, you're going to realize that it is massively parallel. So. So let's talk about the first one that I'm going to talk about today, which is be agile or die. So this is the first thing that I want everybody to understand in their business, as well as the type of technology and the type of solutions that you are providing to the marketplace. When I talk about agile, I don't mean um, just agile development as a software process. I mean you have to be agile as an organization. The idea um, that you need to actually continue to rotate and grow and change and shift around in order to be successful is absolutely huge. But the most important lesson for you is that that's what your customers need as well. And in financial services in particular, the incumbents that are in that space, most of them lack this agility. And in this room, we're filled with, with very talented technology people. And those very talented technology people can bring something to the organizations that we're servicing that they're not actually used to having, which is agility. And this is what they're actually all seeking. So if you can start getting your mindset into the idea that I need to be able to provide agility to these organizations, you can help them. And they're aware of this. Um, David McKay from the CEO of Royal Bank actually said that the biggest barrier to adapting is legacy systems. They understand that the legacy systems that they have in place today are what are holding back their growth. And it's critical that we find ways to help them innovate. Now, sometimes we innovate in the way, uh, like taking the long tail of the clients that aren't being serviced. But a lot of the innovation that we can bring to that marketplace is by bringing new concepts of services and products that they, they can introduce but also in changing the way that they're working with their existing products and services. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about your businesses. The second is that everything, uh, or also along those lines, is that everything needs to be agile from activation to operation. As I said, it's not really just uh, the idea of your software development methodologies that need to be agile. It is everything from activation, starting instantly, um, but also to the operation when we first started Agreement Express, we said to the entire marketplace that we will update 100% of the platforms for our customers every two weeks. These are banks, they're insurance companies, they're wealth management firms. These are some of the largest, most stable organizations in the world. Uh, at the time, we were, t we were partnered with TELUS. TELUS said to us, there's absolutely no way on earth 
that Scotiabank or Hollis or any of those other organizations are going to allow you to update their systems every two weeks because that's what Agile is, but there's no way they're going to let you do it. We recently eliminated our partnership with TELUS because all of our clients wanted to be Agile. They wanted the two week, every one of our customers except for our TELUS based customers were being updated every two weeks. And I think uh, Daryl, who I actually took from that organization, wave Daryl, thank you Daryl, um, will be the first one to attest the fact that what they desperately wanted was that level of agility. So don't listen to what the people are saying. When they say to you, they, they, there's no possible way that a large enterprise like that will actually be able to accept the fact that you're going to keep them that agile, that responsive, they're wrong. They want it and they need it. So it's your job to bring it to them. The second is challenge the impossible. Now that first one might have sounded like the impossible. And so the example I like to use for challenge the, the impossible is I like this one. So uh, it's the Elon Musk quest that the first humans will arrive on Mars in 2025. And I say banks will be able to switch their systems in the same day by 2025. <laughs> now, what's funny about that is that Oh, if I give this presentation, just as many people will actually, in fact, more people will say the statement about the banks will be able to switch their systems on the same day by 2025 is more ludicrous than the idea that we're actually going to be on Mars in 2025. Which for anybody that studied science is going to understand, come on, really? Like there's no, like it's how hard is it going to be to get humans onto Mars in 2025? Why we want to be on Mars in 2025 is beyond me. But come on, of course we can switch the banks in the same day in 2025. Now this is a massive opportunity for all of us that are producing systems for this marketplace. Because we have to shift our mindset from the idea that our value to the organizations, and for those of you that have been in enterprise software, my first major software company that I, that I built up was in enterprise software. We built big systems for big utilities, 18 months to implement, millions of dollars a year, that they would spend with us to, to get the systems in place. And they were held by the handcuffs of the fact that you couldn't remove those systems very quickly. And that is a, that's, a, that's a dead concept. We need to change that. Today, we work from the concept that you should be able to change this out in the same day. And that the reason why you want us to be there is because you like using the, the, what we're providing. Because our service is really good. And I say to people, look, the wrong reason to stay in a relationship is for the children. You don't want to stay in a bad marriage for that reason. You don't want to stay in a bad relationship with your clients for that reason. Just because you have a contract and you're difficult to pull out is a terrible reason to stay around. So build quality material that people want to be there. And you'll be able to start to switch this out. Second lesson. The third lesson is that not many will survive. Not many in this room will survive. When you're trying to start up, that's OK. Challenge the impossible. It's OK that that new organization of what you're trying to do isn't going to work out. I've been really fortunate. The, the vast majority of the, of, the, of the startups I've worked on have actually worked out. I know there is a massive portion of luck with that. In other words, when my next startup comes, probably don't invest in me because it, my, the odds are totally against me at this point. So I'm, I'm running on borrowed time. But not many will survive. But when I'm saying that not many will survive, I'm not talking about the banks. If you're looking for opportunity in the fintech world, don't just look at what the banks are doing or aren't doing. Don't look at what the insurance companies are doing or are not doing. Start looking at what the legacy software companies are doing. Look closely at those organizations and ask yourself, have they built their entire tower of business off of the concept of legacy? Off the concept of I will hold you in because they're gonna be very hard to remove. On the fact it will take six months, 10 months, 12 months, 24 months to implement something. Because epic projects have to die. They have to go away. We have to get to the point that we can provide technology, we're smart enough people, that we can provide technology so that these organizations, no matter how big the enterprise is, can take on what we produce in the same day. Anything that isn't agile today is already the legacy system of tomorrow. If you are taking six months, nine months, 12 months to put it in, you are not a software company. You are a software-enabled services company masking as a software company, and you need to stop thinking that way. And by the way, for those of you that are starting up businesses, those are your targets. Your targets are those organizations that are stuck in this belief that that's what they're gonna need to do, that, that they have 
six month ramp up times, 12 month ramp up times, that, is, that it takes forever to convert a large enterprise. If it's taking you forever to convert a, long, a large enterprise, it's because you haven't tried hard enough. Five years ago, we put this statement on the wall in our organization. We said, one day we'll be implemented, tested, and live within Fortune 500 companies uh, in only two weeks. When we put that out, we were literally nine months to implement. Sometimes a year and a half. A year and a half because what happens is clients get involved and they start to over-engineer everything you're trying to do. Very difficult, very difficult place to be in. In the most recent release of our application, which as you know, we release every two weeks, we were activating in an hour and a half in two and a half hours. Our goal is to keep making this faster. This, when we put the statement on the wall, absolutely nobody believed it. Today, everybody in our organization believes that we are going to be doing this for the largest institutions in the world. And I want you all to take that journey. The reality is the consumerification of complex financial services environments is happening around us. I love what BYOD, what Bring Your Own Device, changed to the large enterprise because it changed our expectation. It changed the idea that we can work with technology that works as easily for me as a person as it does for the enterprise. If you look at the beauty of, of what Google brings out on a daily basis to the, to the world, it's the fact that you don't have a single user manual that you're, well, first you won't find one, uh, but it's like you don't have a user manual and why should we have to have that for anything with respect to the enterprise? At Agreement Express, we take these lessons really seriously. We work so extensively on our user experience, trying to make things that are incredibly complex really easy. Not only the, the business process of onboarding, of taking applications for wealth management accounts or insurance products and things like that, but all the way through all the underwriting that we do for Visa. And we try to make those things as simple as possible so that it's logical and it feels like it flows. For us, and the lesson that I think I want everybody here that's in the financial technology space to think about, is that our legacy, our legacy should be the elimination, elimination ugh, of the last legacy systems. Legacy systems should be an idea of the past. We should be moving that stuff away. Our goal is to try to make these things nice and fast and active and to put ourselves in a position that we ourselves could be disrupted. But don't think that we're actually going to disrupt the banks. We're not going to knock them out of the business. What we're going to do is make them better at what they do, hopefully make them a pleasure to do business with, which I don't think a lot of people have that experience, um, but hopefully make them a pleasure to do business with. And ultimately, we need to make them better organizations. And we've already heard that what happens is if what you're doing is just disrupting a component of their market, they're probably just going to buy you. That's good. But now let's keep adapting ourselves and the way that we think so that we're making the biggest impact we can on the financial services marketplace. Hopefully you found that valuable and I will open it to any questions anybody might have. Thank you very much. How do we have the credibility to sell the first financial institution? Okay, so, um, so as you know, I partnered with TELUS. So one of the first lessons that you should know in, uh, in, in large enterprise sales is that balance sheets win the day. Um, one of our first banks that we ever signed up with, they, uh, they came to us with the insurance requirements uh, that we needed to be able to actually sell to them. And uh, we also, we took that to Aon Insurance. Aon Insurance said uh, they would be worth more dead than alive. Uh, we can't possibly give them that level of insurance. That's why we partnered with TELUS, so we could leave her off their balance sheet. That's get, that's being, that's, as an organization, that was us being agile. And so that we had to be agile that way so that we could, uh, we could, we could move and we could rotate and we could win those deals. They were a great partner. Don't, look, don't get me wrong. They were a great partner. They helped us out as we were going. Just old, old ideas, old concepts that we needed to get past. I think you had a question over here. 2025, what? Where do I see uh, where do I see what the banking sector in Canada in? in oh, fin That's a really tough question. Where do I see fintech in ten years? I think we're going to have a much broader mosaic than we've ever had um, before in the world. First off, the line the globalization lines are just blurring 
uh, left and right. So I think the majority of the firms that we're going to be doing business with in 10 years from now, we've probably never heard of, but they're already established in other countries. One of the things that we see going on is a, is a commonality between regulation across the nations that's allowing, you know, with the flow and transfer of data and money, we have to have unified regulation. Uh, money laundering isn't national money laundering, it's international money laundering. And so with that will come those firms that will help us to change and transform the way that we do business. Does that mean that we're, uh, uh, we're gonna have somebody that wipes out Royal Bank? No, unless their name is uh, another bank that already exists in another country. And I'm not gonna pick which winner it is, so I'm not gonna go out on the limb on that, on that one. But chances are we're gonna be doing business with many international banks. No different to when uh, uh, I think uh, Tangerine was originally a, a startup from ING. Uh, you know, the big Dutch bank. So, you know, I think that's where we're going to end up. Now, from a technology perspective, I think we're going to see the level of mobility that I talked about. I think we're going to be able to be switching in and out systems at a very quick rate, and switching out those systems is going to be key, because that's how those banks are going to stay competitive. The one thing, and I will, and I will, uh, I know they're not here because they're in Spain. BBVA Compass Bank's CEO made a statement uh, probably about a year ago now that we are no longer a bank, we're a technology company. Thank God it will be the easiest competitor I ever took out in my entire life. Because that's a terrible idea. Banks should not become technology companies, but bring it on. I love it. I'll, I'll have to, now, now, will they run themselves out of business? No, they'll run themselves out of a CEO. So, because uh, yeah, that, that's, to me, that's just a crazy idea. If they manage to make that transformation happen, fantastic, good for them. I doubt it. Seriously doubt that one. Yes? Sure. Uh, so we do, uh, we do some pretty sophisticated underwriting. Uh, interestingly enough, and now I'm not talking about uh, life insurance underwriting, I'm talking about risk underwriting with respect to merchant onboarding. So when you're uh, doing, if you're going to be a merchant and you're going to accept Visa, MasterCard, American Express, any of the cards, you actually have to go through a, a process of underwriting so that the acquirer, the people that are going to be processing the cards for your institution ultimately, think that you're an okay risk. Now okay risk actually has multiple levels of what's okay. Um, I'm allowed to do business with you is the first gate. Um, and that changes depending on the institution. If you are uh, a Square customer, for example, um, they could care less about what it is you do as a business. So if you want to do something, you want to have an interesting Google search, not suitable for work, uh, Google Square drug dealer. And you will see online videos from people uh, showing you how to set up your Square account so you can deal drugs. Um, so don't do that though, particularly if you don't know how to clear your browser cache. So, <laughs> do you actually make a credit recommendation? Or do we make a credit recommendation? Yes, but we make credit recommendations based on the intelligence from the underwriters within the organization. One of the secret sauces of organizations in the payments industry is who will they accept and under what terms. They won't actually share it. They don't even like to share it with us, which is really weird because we're the people providing them the systems that are going to tell them. So this is where we actually use learning from the perspective of, well, where are they thresholding? and why are they thresholding, and then we begin to make recommendations. Then we let them decide whether they want to uh, hard approve or hard decline. So I could give you, I, I actually lecture for the payment industry in, in underwriting, so, so don't get me started on that one, I'll be there, I'll be here all night, so, which I know they won't allow me to do. Last question. Last question. Oh, over there. Uh, so the, the question was, uh, we take, my firm takes six to nine months or whatever it is to implement our software. What are the factors that, uh, that allow you guys to do it instantly or to do it in you know, immediate activation? Uh, the number one thing to do is to understand desire paths. Um, the, the, most co the most common desire path in the world is the, is the, is the Twitter hashtag um, because Twitter isn't defining what the trending topic is going to be. The public is defining what the trending topic is going to be. In order for you to implement quickly, you have to do two things. One, you have to bring immediate um, utility to the clients. So out of the box, without any configuration, you have to bring high utility to the clients. The second thing is that you have to give them the intelligence to show how their business is flowing, how to improve on their business using your technology, let those desire paths carve themselves, and then allow them to turn those into actual physical processes. 
That's what you have to do. You essentially, what you want to do is you want to have clients using on day one and improving over time, not planning for six to nine months and then to determining what they're going to put in place. Remember, the longer you let somebody sit down and figure out how to make something foolproof, the faster you're going to realize that fools are too ingenious for you to actually outfool. So you might as well just let the paths happen, figure it out, and, and then let the systems tell the people. This to me is the most basic foundation of AI. Uh, the most basic foundation is telling people more about what's really happening in their business. Thank you, everybody. Look forward to your plan. <laughs>